Thank you very much, Fernando, Tom, uh, for the opportunity to speak today about this topic. And I really have to credit my colleague uh, Shane Devlin at the University of Calgary uh, in Canada for doing a lot of work around this particular topic. Um, so we're going to be talking about quality reporting for colonoscopy and IBD, a little bit of change in gears here about what actually constitutes a good quality report from a colonoscopy for a patient with inflammatory bowel disease. So why are we talking about this? Well, uh, if you were here a little earlier, we talked about variation and how variation is sort of a bad word when it comes to talking about the quality of care, because if there's variation in how something is done, that probably suggests that people aren't doing it quite right. Uh, if people are doing it too much, too little, or not quite uh, the right way. Um, another reason I think it's important that we talk about um, the quality of endoscopy reporting is because of the increased emphasis that we all are recognizing with respect to the importance of understanding the healing of the mucosa in terms of improvement uh, in patient uh, outcomes. So what is a high quality endoscopy report when it comes to inflammatory bowel disease? And uh, we'll talk about uh, some of the work that we've been doing with respect to identifying these elements and maybe leave with some practical guidance and advice about what we might be able to start doing on Monday or next week, the next time we do a colonoscopy on a patient with IBD. So what is the purpose of an endoscopy procedure report? Well, uh, in general, not just with IBD, we certainly want to understand what was done. We want to understand the type of procedure, the interventions, biopsies, why they were done, the indication for the procedure, and how it was done, uh, what kind of scope was used, the distance that was uh, gone in the procedure, whether, whether there were biopsies, where they were taken from, and why they were taken. Uh, we talk about standardized mucosal descriptions as well as uh, a perianal description. Uh, but with, re with respect to IBD, IBD, we, we need some more that might, we might be thinking about in a typical general uh, colonoscopy or endoscopy report. Uh, when it comes to pre-procedure understanding of what we're talking about, disease phenotype, current medications, uh, and the last procedure um, are, uh, are, are important to be thinking about when we're doing our current procedure today. Interprocedurally, there are things that we need to be thinking about in terms of describing the mucosa. Is it inflamed? Is it healed? And what is the extent of the disease? As well as post-procedure issues, the implications of what the findings are and the next steps. So when we talk about improving the quality of endoscopy reporting and inflammatory bowel disease, we're talking about what kind of elements are we thinking about that need to be included in a report that we dictate or that we put together with the help of a, a reporting uh, tool or reporting software um, in order to understand what was actually done and what the implications are of that procedure. Uh, but there really is very little that's been written about in the, with respect to IBD. Primarily, these have been done in the context of colon cancer screening. And there's really little literature and no consensus about what these elements are that should constitute a high quality IBD endoscopy report. So the first paper that really came out that addressed the issue of quality indicators or quality measures for colonoscopy authored primarily by uh, Doug Rex uh, on behalf of the ASGE and the ACG as a joint paper that was published in the Red Journal and in the AC, uh, ASGE Journal um, was, came out in 2006. And uh, thanks, Tom, for reminding me that um, the update to this particular paper came out 48 hours ago um, and uh, can be accessed online. It hasn't even been published in print yet, but certainly can be accessed online um, with an update as to what are the quality indicators for colonoscopy and all sort of all endoscopic procedures. Um, and these are generic quality indicators that we need to be thinking about. And I, I urge everyone, anyone who does endoscopic procedures to really take a look at what these uh, latest updates are for these quality measures, because not only do they tell us what the quality metrics are and what they should be, but also what the target should be, what percentage, what the frequency is of the, of the, um, of the needed um, endoscopic measures that we should be actually reporting. Um, the number one uh, measure that comes up in this particular publication, and actually, in addition to listing the dozens of, of endoscopic uh, quality measures in this paper, uh, or series of papers, they prioritize them for us. And I listed what are the top three measures, if we can only really think about three. And the number one priority actually is describing the indication for the procedure. Is the procedure indication appropriate? And there's data that shows that up to 40% of endoscopic procedures may actually be inappropriate to justify why is it that we're actually performing this procedure. And when it comes to IBD, are we doing it for disease monitoring, for dysplasia surveillance? Are we trying to exclude infection? What are we doing this for? To assess the disease extent so we can manage our patients better. Uh, and a second priority, of course, is documenting informed consent. 
Um, I spoke about variation. Uh, there is some data actually on variation when it comes to the quality of endoscopy reporting. Uh, what this is, it is an analysis uh, Dave Lieberman put together for almost half a million colonoscopy reports. And what this uh, is looking at is in patients undergoing colonoscopy for polyp surveillance, what was, the, what was the proportion of sites that documented or, or, or procedures that were documented on the colonoscopy report when that last colonoscopy was, in terms of t identifying the time interval for the colonoscopy? So was it written on the endoscopy report when that last colonoscopy was? And you can see here that there's incredible variation that doesn't vary, that doesn't vary by site volume, but sort of all over the place. There's actually no uh, conclusive message here, other than to say there's a lot of variation in how this is done. And this is the only data that's really out there in terms of variation for endoscopy reporting. Uh, not specific to IBD, but one could certainly understand and imagine anyone who's read um, colonoscopy reports performed by our colleagues understands of the significant variation that is out there when it comes to endoscopy reporting for IBD. So why do we do endoscopy for IBD? I certainly don't need to uh, convince this audience, but we all know that endoscopy is critical for the management and for decision making uh, for many kinds of decisions when it comes to IBD. Uh, certainly the increased focus, as I mentioned, on mucosal healing in order to make uh, and guide those treatment decisions or maybe decisions not to treat. Uh, dysplasia issues certainly often come back to how that, endo how that endoscopic appearance was initially described at the time that that dysplasia was was identified. Where was it? What did it look like? Where were the biopsies taken from? These are critical issues to documentation that oftentimes when it comes to uh, evaluation of what to do next may require a repeat procedure because it wasn't documented well the first time around. Uh, and despite this, all of these issues in terms of the importance of endoscopy for IBD, the quality of endoscopy reporting as we've seen anecdotally um, is that it's highly variable when it comes to inflammatory bowel disease. Well, let me talk a little bit about uh, understanding the importance of the mucosa, and there's, I'm sure, a lot of talks this weekend talking about why it is that we think mucosal healing is important. So the point is not to go through the importance of mucosal healing, but simply to remind ourselves um, why it is so critical that we describe what we're seeing correctly, and we describe it in a way that others can understand. Um, and this initial slide, I think, is one of the most powerful um, figures um, that, are, that is being shown really in IBD in general today that we're talking about is the lack of correlation between clinical symptoms and what we find on endoscopy. Uh, and what you can see here is the, basically the correlation of the Crohn's disease activity index, a clinical measure scoring system on the, on the y-axis, and the Crohn's disease endoscopic index of severity on the x-axis showing basically a cloud of dots. There's no consistent message here. There's no consistent line other than to say that clinical symptoms do not correlate uh, with endoscopy. So why is mucosal healing important in IBD? Well, certainly in clinical trials, there's increasing emphasis by the regulatory bodies to understand uh, what the impact of a particular therapy might be on the mucosa and on the healing of the mucosa. Uh, but more importantly, in clinical practice, we're also looking toward mucosal healing as an important endpoint of treatment of care uh, and certainly can help guide medical therapy. We can assess disease activity, and in addition, there's growing evidence um, that mucosal healing is associated with a decreased likelihood of a flare, increased, uh, decreased risk of progression to disease complications, decreased needs for surgery and hospitalization, decreased risk for dysplasia and colorectal cancer. Lots of reasons why it's important to understand what does that mucosa look like and then to describe it well. There's also data that goes back more than 10 years telling us the importance of mucosal healing, but not only that, but the, what the relevance is of not finding mucosal healing. Uh, and this is one study that showed uh, the risk of progression to surgery in patients with Crohn's disease who did not have a healed mucosa. So just want to give a practical example. Um, if we talk about the importance of, of describing the mucosa well, well, what does this tell us about the patient's prognosis? I just showed you a study that showed that when you've got active inflammation and Crohn's disease, deep ulcers, that lends uh, to a risk of colectomy. Well, this patient was referred to my colleague, uh, Dr. Siegel, for a second opinion, and uh, this is the report that he got. Colon had some inflammation. Well, what, what's he supposed to do with that? We'll talk about the spelling aside, but we can at least read the handwriting. Or another report that Dr. Devlin received uh, when thinking about disease extent for a patient and under trying to think with the patient what the best options for therapy, uh, receiving this report in a patient with ulcerative colitis. There was evidence of colitis in the colon. A biopsy was taken. What are you supposed to do with that? So we do have uh, 
standardized scoring systems and standardized ways of describing the mucosa, and I just want to walk through them really briefly, not to really go through them in detail. Actually, Gary Lichtenstein is going to be giving a talk, I think it's tomorrow morning, um, about how we can use these endoscopic scoring systems in our practice, and um, anyone interested, I would certainly urge you to go and hear about that. But the point is, is that we do have standardized ways of describing the mucosa that can, in some way, have been, have been validated to a certain extent, each one of these, and also when we see reports that describe what these actual scoring systems may have revealed, we can understand a little bit uh, in more detail about what was actually seen at the time of that report. So this is the simple endoscopic scoring system uh, for Crohn's disease, which looks at the size of ulcers, the uh, percentage of ulcerated surface, the affected surface, and the presence of narrowings. And this is a, a, scoring, uh, a score that really needs to be reported in each segment of the colon and in the terminal ilium. Um, the um, uh, ulcerative colitis, uh, um, there are many indices to assess uh, the appearance of the colonic mucosa. Uh, one commonly used one is the Mayo endoscopic subscore, and this is again something I'm just showing as an example of a scoring system that when you see a report of this, you have an idea about what it actually means. I'm looking at a basic, very simple scoring system, a zero through three scale, uh, going from a normal colon to mild ulcerative colitis, moderate ulcerative colitis, and on the bottom right, severe ulcerative colitis. And for patients with Crohn's disease who've had prior surgery, understanding uh, the future of their risk for recurrence clinically and surgically uh, can be determined with a Ruckiert score. And understanding what that actual anastomotic area looks like, both in the anastomosis and slightly uh, deeper into the ileum, uh, can give us insight, uh, really a crystal ball into the future of that patient's prognosis for IBD and can help guide um, the, the clinical decision making for treatment at the time of that colonoscopy. Uh, so another a uh, very useful, simple scoring system that gives us insight as to what, uh, what's actually going on at the time of that procedure that can be reported. So when it comes to reporting, there's lots of different ways that reporting can be done. Uh, some people can, you can dictate, you can write, whatever. The report has to get done. Uh, and, and certainly increasingly, I would bet that the vast majority of us in the room use reporting software in order to document our reports. Well, there's a lot of things that we love about reporting software. We can define our fields. And when those fields are defined, the data entry is structured. And when its data entry is structured, we can easily search for it for research and also for understanding our own quality metrics. Uh, it enhances communication. It's very easy to send an electronic report to a colleague, uh, to, to other providers that are involved in the care of the patient. It's easy to screen reports quickly for safety issues uh, and understand um, maybe some of the risks associated with the procedures in a standardized way. Uh, patients actually may have uh, access to their own reports uh, in a program, for example, that we're piloting where patients will have access to all of their medical notes and records, and I know that many institutions are, are going that way as well to give patients access to their dictated reports. Uh, and for those making the switch from dictation, transcription uh, costs can certainly be reduced when you've got an electronic record. On the other hand, we all know that there's things about reports, uh, elect uh, sorry, about um, electronic reporting that we hate. Certainly they can be cumbersome. There's certainly a learning curve when it comes to learning a new software program. Language in these reporting programs may be incoherent. They sometimes may have classification systems with no embedded descriptors. You have to rely on the system and, and use, the infer use the words and terminology that are in there, which are often uh, very difficult and cumbersome to utilize. And end up, we often end up uh, perhaps using free text more than we'd like. And when we use free text, it takes more time for us to do that and it also is a lot more difficult to search by. This is a project, and I mentioned Shane's involvement, Shane Devlin, who took the lead on this project, where we aimed uh, to identify what kinds of elements are key and critical to defining a high-quality endoscopy report. Uh, this is called the Umpire Project Quality Template for IBD Endoscopy Reporting, and the goal really was to incorporate these results ultimately into various commercially available endoscopy reporting programs, which is currently a work in, pro in progress. Uh, we, to identify these elements of what actually should go into a standardized report, we use the RAND appropriateness methodology, which is an iterative process. You start really with a very broad approach with a, with a multidisciplinary or expert panel going through the literature to really identify what kind of elements does the literature suggest should be included. Um, and in order to go through this process, we started very broadly with 120 potential elements that should go into a high quality endoscopy report. And at the end, uh, there were 51 elements which were thought to be important to be included in a final content of what elements should go into a high quality endoscopy report. Uh, 
Uh, and these, available, these results will be available in a publication, but I just want to walk through some very high-level uh, data that we, uh, that, uh, that to share with you with respect to these elements that should go into a high-quality endoscopy report for inflammatory bowel disease. So number one, in terms of the pre-procedure, what is that background information? What is the disease phenotype? Not just patient has IBD, and that's the indication for going, uh, having the procedure, but what is the actual disease phenotype? What is disease duration, especially if we're talking about a patient who's undergoing surveillance? And what therapy are they on at the time of their examination? That's really critical information. Are they on maximum dose 10 milligrams per kilogram every four weeks of infliximab at the time of their procedure? That might portend a very different management strategy than somebody who's on no therapy at all. Uh, what is the indication for the procedure? And to describe, is the patient symptomatic or asymptomatic at the time of their procedure? Are we doing this for dysplasia surveillance or are we doing this for disease monitoring? Some high-level uh, uh, elements for procedure details. What was the maximum extent of examination? The colon was examined to the terminal ileum. Well, what does that mean? How far into the terminal ileum actually uh, was reached? Did you get beyond the area of, of inflammation that might have been seen in the very, very distal terminal ileum or the afferent limb when it comes to a pouchoscopy? Uh, and if a patient undergoes surveillance colonoscopy, what kind of technique was used? Was it white light with multiple biopsies? Was it chromoendoscopy? And then findings, descriptors of the disease. And we, we were very careful not to uh, require sp the use of a specific uh, re uh, descriptor of disease, but the idea is to use some kind of standardized description of what the disease is so that somebody else reading your report can actually uh, understand what actually happened and what actually the mucosa looked like. So this is an example from the real world. Uh, this is using Provation software, which uh, we've been working with as one company. Uh, and Provation, you can see, uh, has a very uh, simple to use drop down menu. Uh, and walking through a few elements of an endoscopy report. This is a patient, and going through the patient profile, the disease type is ileocolonic without perianal disease. Quick and easy. Moving on to the next thing, uh, what kind of therapy was the patient on? Checking off the common uh, IBD medications there. Uh, is the patient symptomatic at the time of the procedure? Checking off, patient has mild symptoms. Uh, and uh, uh, why are we doing this procedure? Well, the patient has colon and small bowel disease, and we want to assess response to therapy. Uh, literally, as fast as I'm saying this, this is how quickly this report can be generated. And what did we find? Well, based on the uh, appearance of the, um, of the anastomosis, the record score was an I0. Uh, and then the software puts it all together into a nice report um, with actual verbiage and words that can be um, then sent off to whatever the referring provider might have wanted. So uh, I want to end off with saying, okay, well, that's all nice and good. Um, and uh, this is more stuff coming down the road. This is a work in progress, hopefully to enable um, users to use it to be incorporated into software that uh, many of us might already be using. But what can we do now? What can we do next week? What can we do with our next colonoscopy? Uh, and the, the the, the answer is you can do anything, pick one thing, and start with that. Uh, and so the next time you see this, this is an ileocolonic anastomosis, um, describe it in a way that gives more detail, gives more, uh, more uh, a granularity in the report so that others can understand what it was that you were looking at. In doing this uh, procedure, when was that last surgery that the patient uh, had this anastomosis done? When was the last colonoscopy that this was evaluated? What drugs is the patient currently on? How far did you get into the ileum to actually look uh, and see, or was it just a picture of the anastomosis? And uh, get comfortable with these scoring systems. They're very easy to use and, again, uh, help others who see your reports understand what it was that you were actually looking at. So in summary, the endoscopic appearance of the gut mucosa is now one of our most critical endpoints. Uh, we know that uh, endoscopy reporting in general is highly variable. With IBD, it's probably even more variable than typical colonoscopy. Uh, not all elements of reports are required in every procedure, and uh, inclusion of these elements will hopefully improve the quality of reports and improve the quality of care, and maybe even reduce the number of excess colonoscopies that need to be performed for patients being referred for additional opinions. Um, and just to remind everyone that this content hopefully will get added to endoscopy reporting software that we all are using. Thank you very much for your attention.